Hello, uh, my name is Brian Kent. Uh, welcome to my talk. This is Applications of Modern Survival Modeling with Python. So if you think back, I know it's difficult, but think back to 2018 before the COVID uh, pandemic, one of the things going on was the scooter craze um, around the United States and around the world. I included a picture here of a bunch of scooters uh, in a pile, partly to help you remember, but also uh, to highlight one of the interesting issues with scooters as a business, which is how long do they last? There was a report that came out uh, roughly a year into the scooter craze, which found that uh, scooters only lasted about a month, which severely impacted the unit economics. In particular, if we look at uh, the unit economics for a single scooter, for a piece of equipment, for a piece of hardware, we have our, our usual equation here, profit equals revenue minus cost. And that revenue is broken down into the revenue per ride, how many rides does a scooter get per day, and how many days is a scooter in service before it dies, before it's broken, um, uh, beyond the point of repair, minus the cost of that scooter. And what that analysis showed, this was from uh, data that the city of Louisville leaked accidentally, uh, was that revenue per ride was about $3.70. Rides per day was about three and a half. The cost of a scooter was about five hundred and fifty dollars. And so, if you if you and the days in service uh, was only twenty eight days. And so, if you total all that up, you get a profit per scooter of not even counting operating costs of negative one hundred and eighty seven dollars, which of course is pretty terrible. And so, one of the interesting things is most of these numbers, revenue per ride, rides per day, cost of the scooter, haven't changed that much. But one thing that is changing is the days in service. So one of the big questions here is, how many days do scooters really last? This is a fundamental aspect of this entire business model. And in fact, a year and a half goes by, and some of these companies have been able to not only understand the lifespan of scooters, but to optimize that lifespan to get themselves toward profitability. All of this to say that Lifespans are interesting, lifespans matter, and in some cases like this, durations of time are actually the fundamental thing that a business might care about understanding and optimizing. So that's the setup. Uh, you're probably asking, who am I? Who is this guy? Why should I listen to him? Uh, a couple important caveats that I want to say right up front is that I am not a survival analysis expert. I'm more like you out there in the audience. I'm a, I'm a data science practitioner. I've been in the field for several years at a variety of organizations, big and small, new and old, uh, and a variety of roles. Uh, and one of the things I've noticed is that despite its power, despite its, its expressiveness, survival analysis has almost never come up in my work, even though it really should. Uh, and so... Um, well, we'll get to the goals on the next slide. But the other the other point I wanted to make is that I am a Python practitioner primarily. Um, and so the code snippets in this talk will be in Python, but it's important to note that there is a lot of good code, a lot of good tools in R as well. So I wanted to highlight that part of my background. So what are the goals? What will I get from this talk? This is uh, primarily you know, my sales pitch, uh, I don't actually want money, but this is my sales pitch for the field of survival analysis and survival modeling. And so what I hope, I hope you take away from this talk is that first off, very simply that survival analysis is a thing. When you come to certain problems, new problems, new tasks in your work uh, or your team's work, I hope you remember to think about whether survival analysis might be a good fit for your situation. And that I think is the, is the biggest, most important step toward adding survival analysis to your working tool set. So in particular, when, when, you, you know, when you come to that situation, when should you consider about going forward with survival analysis or digging deeper versus doing something simpler or something, something shorter? Uh, and then when you do uh, attempt a survival analysis, what kinds of information can you hope to get out of it? Uh, and then a, a couple small code snippets. This is not end-to-end -end kind of uh, solutions, but some small code snippets, and most importantly, pointers to more resources so you can dive deeper later. So as I said, what you won't get from this talk is step-by-step -step recipes for how to do this. You also won't get uh, in-depth statistical knowledge. Um, again, this is a high-level kind of sales pitch for the field. So uh, I'm not going to talk about a lot of the assumptions that underpin these methods, a lot of the caveats, but this is really important stuff. So if you do, if you are convinced, which would be great, and you want to put survival modeling into practice in a high-impact field, it's really important to, to dive deeper and look into these assumptions and caveats before you do so. 
uh, throughout the slides, I'll have these little red stars, which indicate some of my kind of opinion, some of my takeaways that you might not find in survival analysis textbooks. So keep an eye out, uh, open for those. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the content. First up is the context. Uh, when do we want to think about potentially using survival modeling? So there's two parts of this context, I think. The first part is, what is the question that we're trying to ask and answer? And, and the question is, how long will it take for some event to occur? Survival analysis is concerned with durations of time before key events happen, key transitions happen. So most uh, canonically, of course, and the reason for the name survival analysis is medicine, medical research. In particular, how long until a patient dies or potentially has a recurrence of a disease. So what we're measuring there, the duration of time is the survival of that patient. But, and this is, this is you know, one of the first big takeaways from this talk is that it's not just about medicine. Don't be fooled by the name survival analysis. This applies to lots of other applications. So most, most analogously is, is hardware, equipment failure. This is the scooter example. How long until a scooter dies, uh, metaphorically speaking, um, this applies to basically any piece of hardware. I've seen people use this for jet engines, for example, or uh, silicon manufacturing equipment. It, yeah, so anything you have that's hardware, this can apply to. In business, this could be, for example, uh, how long until a contract is terminated? How long until customers churn from a subscription service? How long until employees resign from the company? And in finance, an example, how long until somebody defaults on a loan? Just as examples. So, so the, the big take home again is it's not just about medicine. There's lots of other applications. One of the other uh, take home, I think, messages is that the event in survival analysis doesn't have to be bad. These events tend to have some sort of moral weight to them. So we talk about survival. Well, we, we want to survive. Survival is a good thing. The outcome of death is a bad thing. But this is not always the case in survival analysis. So even within medicine, we can flip this. So how long until a disease is cured or how long until a patient is discharged from the hospital? In business, how long until a prospective customer converts and actually makes the transaction? How long until support tickets are closed or engineering tickets are closed? Uh, in product, how long until a new product reaches some threshold number of users or customers? And in finance, just as well as you could say how long until a customer defaults on a loan, you could say how long until that person repays the loan in full. Um, so so the, the event that we're interested in doesn't have to be bad. And we may want to shorten the time or accelerate the time to that event, not prolong it. Uh, and then another important note is that there are wrinkles of survival analysis where the event never occurs. So another connotation that's a bit unfortunate from the name survival analysis is that uh, the outcome definitely will happen. I mean, if we're talking about biological death, uh, you know, especially for mammals, that event will definitely happen at some point. But in some cases, the event never occurs. So sales conversion being a great example of this, some fraction of, of prospective customers never complete that sales funnel. Um, and that's okay. Survival analysis can still apply in that situation. The other big part of the context is what's called censoring data censoring, um, which is to say that for some subjects, some units of study, we don't observe the event. Um, so for example, in medicine, we would not observe a patient's death, for example. And in fact, if we look at the little diagram, my little sort of back of the envelope diagram on the right, I feel that this is actually a more defining characteristic of survival analysis. Uh, because what happens is, well, to go to the second bullet, why do we not observe uh, the, the events? Well, the first thing that happens is the event just hasn't happened yet. It may happen, but we need to close our study. We need to move on. We need to make decisions. We need to draw conclusions and make decisions based on the data that we've seen so far, even though, uh, take the scooters, for example, not all scooters have, have died yet, but we need to make a decision about whether our new scooter design or our new repair program is having an effect after just a month or two when scooters might last a year or two years. So we need to make a decision and move on. That's the biggest reason that I've seen in business for censored data. And that's reflected in that, in that table to the right, which is that even when, if time to event matters, we still may be in a world where we're doing sort of simple regression. We're just predicting, you know, our outcome variable as time to event. But if we've seen all the data, that's a simple regression. Um, it's only if we need to take into account censored data, unobserved events, not yet observed events, where we need to think about survival analysis. 
So censoring can happen for a couple other reasons. Uh, like I said in the previous slide, the event may never happen, as in sales conversions. And then what something that happens primarily, I think, in medicine, but also applied to the scooter situation, is that the subject may be lost. So a scooter may be stolen, for example. It doesn't mean it died. We don't know when it died, but it was stolen. So that's that's an interesting um, wrinkle that survival analysis can take take into account through this kind of censoring uh, construction. So moving on to sort of the big picture of the survival analysis process, and especially focusing on the left side of this kind of graphic here, the way I think about this is there's kind of a, a progression through data objects. We're going to start with an event log, and I'll show examples of this in the next few slides. So don't try to memorize this table. We'll start with an event log. We'll transform that into a duration table, and then we'll transform that into a survival table and then a survival curve. And I'll explain what all those mean in the next few slides. Um, and then this leads to a variety of, of methods we might want to do, like parametric curve fitting or hypothesis testing, which are then in turn in service of tasks, bigger picture tasks that we might want to accomplish, like building intuition, description about the distribution of survival, forecasting a survival curve, predicting outcomes for a particular subject, uh, or actually drawing conclusions about whether how to influence uh, the survival of subjects, how to prolong or accelerate survival time. So that's the big picture. And we're going to start on the left side with these data objects, because I think that's a different way to explain it than you might see in some of the other treatments of survival analysis. So first up, we have event logs. So this data is, is well, as far as I know, real data. This is data that's taken from the retail rocket Kaggle competition from a few years ago. You'll see in some of those timestamps there about 2015. Uh, I've modified the data. I've downsampled the data to help illustrate some of the concepts. So if you try to reproduce this on the full retail rocket data set, you won't get the same answers. Uh, but this is data, this is actual data that I pulled from Kaggle. Each row in this table describes an event. And, and so each event has at a minimum three columns. We have a unit ID or a subject ID. In this case, they call it a visitor. So a visitor ID, we have a timestamp for the event. So that first row, uh, this event happened on the on June 10th of 2015 at 20 hours, 40 minutes. And there's an event type. So in this case, the event type of that event was a view. So this visitor viewed some item on the Retail Rocket uh, e-commerce website. If you look down that event column, you'll see that there are three event types. This is a pretty simple data set. The visitor can view an item. They can add that item to their shopping cart and they can actually make a transaction. They can purchase an item. Um, there, there are other fields initially in this data set that I have ignored just for the purposes of illustration. So what we're interested in now is these minimum set of columns of the subject ID, the timestamp, and the event type. And so what we want to know is how long until the visitor makes their first transaction. So I've put these, these red lines across the, the table to show the separation between three different visitors. That first visitor, 11922, has three view events, but never makes a transaction. The last, the last few rows, um, subject one, three, five, et cetera, has a couple of view events. They add something to their cart, but they don't actually have a transaction. So again, just like the first visitor, this is sensor data because we haven't yet seen a transaction in the data before this, this data set collection was closed. The middle customer there, the middle visitor, one, zero, five, uh, they do have a transaction event. So we know the duration of time from, from when they first came into the system to when they made their first transaction. And we, we want to know what the distribution of that duration is across the data set. So uh, following on that last thought about two of these users, we don't have a transaction. One of them does have a transaction. So what are our options in dealing with that sensor data? Well, the first option, which is, I think, what the person who was analyzing the scooter data did was they just dropped the data points that don't have a transaction. They just dropped them from the data set completely, which is a really bad idea because you're going to uh, completely bias your estimate of the duration until that a key event happens. So definitely don't just drop the data that doesn't have the, the key event, in this case, a transaction. The second option is to threshold durations. So we say, uh, if the if this visitor in this retail rocket example hasn't made a transaction within 14 days, let's say that they haven't made a transaction. Let's just declare our period of observation, our period of interest to be 14 days. 
And we'll turn this into a binary classification problem where they either did or didn't make a transaction in that window. That can work. That's not necessarily a terrible decision, but it only works if the, uh, if the decision cadence uh, is longer than that duration of interest. So the flip side of this would be the scooter example where we want to make a decision in a few weeks as to whether a new repair program is working or not. Uh, but the scooter lifetimes are maybe on the order of several months. In that case, our decision cadence is faster than the lifespans, and we're going to have a lot of sensor data. We're not going to have a very good understanding of the distribution of survival times or even the fraction of scooters um, that are that are that die, or in this case, transactions that complete. So, option two of thresholding can work, but only if the decision cadence is longer than the lifespans. Option three is survival analysis. And that's what we're going to talk about, of course, in more detail. And, and the basic logic of survival analysis, is, so now survival analysis is that even for the subjects where we don't see that event, we know that event has taken at least some period of time to happen. So in this case, visitor 11922 at the top of our table here uh, has taken at least four minutes for something to happen. That's a very short period of time in this data set, but they have taken at least, uh, or I guess almost five minutes to make a transaction. So let's not throw that data away. Let's take that into account. Only when we get beyond that, that user's known uh, lifespan, do we then think about not including their information in the calculations, but let's use what we do have as fully as we can. That's the, that's the general ethos, the general spirit of survival analysis. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to move from the event log to a duration table. So the first thing you'll notice is um, now the rows represent subjects, not events. So in particular, we had previously multiple rows for each of the visitors. Now we have one row for each visitor. So we've kind of pivoted that events table a bit. So visitor uh, 11922, for example, we have their entry time, which is their, their first time stamp, the earliest time stamped. We have the transaction time, which for them is it doesn't exist. It's it's not there. Um, so that's just a, a, an, an NA. It's a, it's a uh, missing data. The the crux of this table is the final obs time. Obs stands for observation here in my schema. So the final observation time is the crux of this table. It is either the time of the transaction, which we don't have for this user, or it's the last uh, known moment that we would have observed that user. Um, so in this case, what I've used is the last timestamp across the whole data set, because we know they didn't make a transaction in that entire window. So that's like, if we had seen a transaction, we would have seen it before then. Um, so we know they went at least that long without having a transaction. So that's the final ops time column. And that's the crux of, of the censoring logic. And then the last two columns are what typically goes into survival analysis tools. And it's basically just a transformation of those previous two columns. The, the final column there on the right has transaction is just a true false Boolean for the transact time. If there's a transaction, it's true. If there's no transaction, it's false. Pretty straightforward. It's, that's the opposite of the censoring flag. And then the duration is just the difference between the entry time of each subject and the final observation time. So you'll see, um, you know, the, the person who did make a transaction here, in this case, a visitor 105, uh, they made that transaction very quickly uh, within the same day that they first entered the system. For the other two users who haven't had a transaction, you know, uh, roughly 100 days have gone by uh, where we know they haven't yet made a transaction. So that's a duration table. We've just basically pivoted the events table to get the key dates, the key timestamps for each subject. And then we've turned that into durations and the censorship flag. From there, I mean, as I said, those last two columns typically go into survival analysis tools directly, which then give you all sorts of other things like survival curves, hazard curves, et cetera. But I think it's instructive to actually look what happens under the hood when we can convert this duration table to a survival table. So when we do that, now again, we've changed the, the index. Our rows now don't represent subjects. We've rolled this up. So now our rows represent durations of time. So in that left column of this table here, we see duration one, two, three, four, five. Those are days, days of elapsed time since users signed up or, or entered our system, visitors entered our system. And so at each duration, like if we take say duration three, so three days of elapsed time since visitors first entered the system, we have three, three key columns here. 
The first is what I've called still waiting. We're still waiting for those visitors to make a transaction three days after they enter the system. We have 1,010 of those users out of 1,500 who originally entered the system. At that duration, at three days, um, 27 of them had some outcome event. The outcome event could be they had a transaction or they were censored, which would happen because basically in this data set, we ran out of time. So those two users there on row three on the right side in the censored column, those were users who entered the system at the end, toward the end of our study, and we only saw them for three days and then the study ended. So they're censored at, at three days. So the survival table now is, is really important. This, this roll up to durations of time is really, uh, that's where a lot of the magic happens because that's what we're going to represent on our survival curve. We've switched from kind of a, a timestamp calendar chronology of time to thinking about elapsed durations of time. So this, this switch from durations to survivals is really key. So those are the, the three kind of key data objects, event logs, duration tables, survival tables. Now let's look at what we get out of survival analysis. These are the survival analysis outputs. I alluded to this earlier, but in the big picture, there are the same three things that we want to get from any data science, data analysis, machine learning study. We want to describe distributions uh, and understand distributions, intuit what's going on in our data. We want to influence systems and we want to predict. What's kind of strange in survival analysis is unlike some other fields, the vast majority of treatments will stay in the describe bucket. Most of the things that we talk about, most of the things that other books and blog posts, uh, you know, API docs we'll talk about are in the description bucket. But I think in, in business especially, I mean, whether it's hardware or business operations, customer support, et cetera, what we really want to do is predict uh, for a particular subject, which very few uh, treatments talk about, and influence the system. We want to know what causes longer or shorter survival durations so we can influence that. In the scooter case, the company wants to make their scooters last longer. They want to cause the survival time to be longer. So this is, again, pretty rare where this, there is a lot of literature is in randomized controlled trials in medicine. So experiments where we get two different survival curves for two different samples, and we want to see if those two samples are statistically significantly different. So we'll show that, show an example of that kind of hypothesis test. But let's talk through the descriptive side first. Um, on the right here, we see an example survivor, survival curve. This is from the data that I was showing previously. Um, it's how to read the survival curve is, is one of the key take homes here. If, if, if we don't get to anything else, just understand how to read the survival curve and what kind of information comes off of a, off a survival curve. So in this example, we have, again, the survival duration on the X axis. This is days until the customer or the visitor's first transaction, that retail rocket data. So if we look at, say, on the x-axis, 40 days until the first transaction, the survival probability on the y-axis is 0 0.4. Uh, in this case, um, survival is bad, right? We want our visitors, assuming we're retail rocket, we want our visitors to make their first transaction as quickly as possible. So the lower the survival, survival meaning they haven't yet made a transaction, the lower the survival, the better for retail rocket. And so... Um, in this case, there is no better or worse. We're not comparing anything, but knowing that, it, you know, so uh, within a day, we have roughly 25% uh, of the visitors making their first purchase. That's interesting to know. And then by day 40, you know, 60% have made their first purchase, 40% have still not made a first purchase. <clears throat> um, there's a little bit of code on this slide. So we're going to start into some code snippets here. One of the big take home messages is that in Python land, at least the lifelines package is excellent. And it's definitely the place to start for any of your survival analysis um, analysis. Uh, there are other packages I'll, I'll highlight at the end, but um, lifelines is always the place to start. It has excellent documentation, uh, which is a great place to learn survival analysis, even if you end up using a different tool ultimately. And in this case, we're using something called the Kaplan-Meier fitter to draw the survival curve based on the duration table that I showed previously. So in the code, we have dur, D-U-R is the duration table. And we're just gonna provide that duration days and the has transaction columns, those last two columns to the Kaplan-Meier fitter. We instantiate the object, the Kaplan-Meier fitter, and then we fit it. And then it gives us this survival function um, attribute, which we can then plot directly on, on this graph. 
So it's, it's in terms of code, it's just four lines of code. It's actually very simple once we have that duration table in the form that the lifelines package needs. And then we get to all this power of the survival curve. As I was mentioning on the survival curve, um, I was trying to, as you can see, do some, some logic in my head to flip the percentage that had, had actually made a transaction. There's one other very related thing, which is called a cumulative incidence curve, which is just one minus the survival curve. In cases where the outcome is, is good or may never happen, this is often a more useful representation because we can think of this as conversion rates. So this is an example in the retail rocket case where we do actually have a conversion rate. It's just a sales conversion. And so it's more useful to think about flipping this curve um, so we can talk about, you know, by day 20, 50% of our visitors have converted to a sale. So keep that in mind when you think about survival curves. I'm going to stick with survival curves for the rest of this talk because it's a more common thing to see. But for cases like e-commerce sales, um, cumulative incidence curves make actually make more sense. So <clears throat> one, of the, one of the methods I want to talk about is comparing differences, comparing two survival curves, looking for differences between survival curves. Now, I've labeled this slide causality. But let me emphasize that hypothesis testing and causality are not the same thing. So let's pretend here, let's pretend that we had run a randomized controlled experiment. As you'll see on the plot and in the code, that's not what I've actually done. I've pulled out the monthly cohort for May and June. Um, I've plotted those survival curves so you can see what they look like. And then I'm going to use what's called a log rank test, again, from Lifelines, to, to test as whether these two curves are different. Uh, so again, not cause this is not causality, but imagine we had run a randomized controlled experiment and we had these two curves for each of our two samples, then we might want to test if the difference between them is statistically significant. And we would do that with uh, the log rank test in lifelines. Another thing we might want to do, speaking of monthly cohorts, is track our outcome Time to, this time to event um, across cohorts, across time. And so in this case, I've separated out all the monthly cohorts in the retail rocket down sample data set that I'm using. And you'll immediately see we have a problem in that uh, you know, the, the data set starts in May and we see that survival curve go all the way out to the end of the, the graph at 130 days or so. But September only has 17 days of data. That's the orange line on the curve. Um, it looks interesting. It looks like it's substantially lower than the other monthly cohort curves, which is good for Retail Rocket, right? We want, we want uh, to accelerate the outcome. So we want lower survival probabilities. But we only have 17 days of data. So how do we know if that's actually uh, usefully different in the end from the May and the June curves? Well, what we can do is we can actually fit parametric uh, distributions to these curves. Again, we're going to use lifelines for this. Apologies, the code is a little bit uh, smaller now. But what we're going to do is fit uh, what's the Weibull distribution, which is very common in survival analysis. Uh, there's many distributions we can fit to this. Uh, lifelines documentation describes many of them. I chose Weibull here because it looked like a decent fit and because it's very common. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to pull out the data, the durations for each month. That's dur month here in, in the code just using this Python pandas query call. So for each month, then we're going to instantiate this Weibull fitter. This is a parametric model fitter. And then we fit it again with the same columns that we've been using before with dur month, now duration, and with has transactions. So how long for each subject did it take for them to make a transaction? And then did they actually make a transaction or not? Uh, and then we get this curve out for each of those cohorts. We can plot it and we can see much more intuitively, much more visually, that indeed the September cohort is tracking to a much better performance than the earlier cohort. So that's a very interesting finding. If I were, you know, if I had done something at Retail Rocket to try to improve the customer experience, to improve the checkout experience, for example, to improve the website in general, this would be very interesting to know that it seems to be working, that my results in September are, are very promising so far, with one caveat, which is that this is only true to the extent that the Weibull uh, distribution is actually a good fit to this data. So you can fit lots of distributions and they, they could be terrible fits. So it's important to, to go back and make sure this is actually a decent fit to your data. I'm not going to show that here, but I wanted to make sure that caveat was out there. Still, it's, this is a, a very cool, cool functionality to be able to sort of look into the future for each of these cohorts, even the fairly recent, fairly young cohorts. 
So speaking of forecasting, another thing we might want to do looking into the future is to predict the survival for specific subjects. And again, now we're getting into that, that third bucket where there's very little treatment of this in the classic survival literature. Um, and there's, there's an increasing number of tools that have come out over the past few years to help with this, especially from the machine learning side. And I'll reference one of those at the end. Um, but this is where it starts, the ice starts to get a little bit thin here in terms of the methodology, in terms of uh, the, the, the tooling for this and understanding how, this, how these systems actually work. But let's work through an example, a pretty simple example. Um, so the first thing is we're going to predict using covariance. So this is a classic machine learning prediction context and that we're going to use the conditional distribution, the, the distribution of the outcome, time to event and censoring, conditional on some covariates. In this case, um, the data, as far as I know, doesn't have covariates, so I've made them up. So now we're really far away from the retail rocket real data. I've just generated uh, two more columns. You'll see on the table, we have on the right side now, age and channel. We'll also use the entry month, which did come from the real data, as another covariate. So we have three covariates, entry month, age. Imagine we have the age of the visitor. I don't know how we would have this, but imagine we have it and the channel, which is meant to be like the acquisition channel. So if someone came to Retail Rocket's website from Facebook or, or Twitter um, versus organic, where they actually searched for something uh, on the search engine, and then that's how they got to the website. So we have three covariates, early month, age, and channel. And we're going to be trying to predict uh, the, the survival distribution um, and statistics about that distribution for each of these subjects. So let's, let's look at a little, bit, a little bit of code. As I mentioned, this is a regression model now. So it gets starting to get a little bit more complex than what we've looked at so far with these univariate um, non-parametric Kaplan-Meier estimator and the parametric Weibull estimator. So now we're in regression land. There, there is a very, very standard model here called the Cox proportional hazard model. There, this has you know, decades of literature written about it, um, and I'm certainly not the best expert at this, but I certainly encourage you to read the Lifelines literature to, to understand it better. Um, in the code, we're going to use a train test split from Scikit-Learn um, to get our training set. Uh, I'm not going to touch too much on how to evaluate these models. There's a, there's a lot of good information in a package called Scikit Survival about how to evaluate uh, uh, survival, survival models. But we get, we get our training set. This is dir underscore train. We, again, from lifelines, instantiate a Cox pH fitter. That's Cox proportional hazards fitter. And then we fit it. It's very, very similar to the past uh, calls that we've made with lifelines objects. Uh, we pass it the, the data frame, dir train. We give it the duration column, which is duration. Uh, the censoring column, or the, the, uh, the converse of censoring, which is has transaction, the event column. And then the only new thing is we're going to give it a formula which describes the features that we're going to use, the covariates that we're going to use to make our prediction. Uh, that's it. That's that's you know, again, it's you know three lines of code in terms of the model, the Cox pH fitter. So pretty simple stuff. Although again, I would encourage you to read more about the the underlying um, statistics of the model to understand what what the limitations are. Now, prediction and survival modeling does get more complicated because we have to answer some questions. The first one is, what is the kind of output that we want from our model? Do we want to get the entire survival curve? Do we want to get some function of that curve, like the median or the mean? Or do we want to get the rank order of subjects in terms of when their uh, event is likely to occur? Do we just want a sort of a prioritization of the subjects in terms of the events? When you think about it though, this isn't that different from classic regression settings. I mean, regression is also normally the expected value of the outcome given the covariates. Um, so we sort of have a sense that it's already a single number for each subject. But in reality, it is a distribution. And we just happen to use the expected value, the mean uh, of the outcome distribution as a standard. So it's not really that different survival analysis. It's just that we tend to think of it, tend to think of the distribution more immediately, more automatically in survival analysis than we do in more classic regression settings. One of the other wrinkles that I'm not gonna show in the code here, but in survival analysis, we also have to think about whether we're predicting for a new subject who is coming into our system from scratch or a subject who's already in the system, but censored. So someone, for example, in the retail rocket setting who came in 
uh, you know, who's been there for three weeks, hasn't yet had a transaction, the question would be how much more time will pass until they have their first transaction versus someone who just came in right now, but will the total time, uh, total elapsed duration of time be until that new subject has their first transaction. So that's something very important to keep in mind. So let's look at uh, the new subject case. Uh, and then I would, I would encourage you again to go to the Lifelines literature to see uh, there's a nice paragraph there about uh, predicting for the censored subject case. For predicting for a specific subject, there's a lot of information on, on this slide. So I would say, uh, fo let's focus on the top left now in the code. There are, we, you know, from the previous slide, we have our CPH, that's our Cox Proportional Hazard Model. We have that object trained already using our duration table. So there's basically two methods we're interested in. CPH.PredictSurvival function um, and cph.predictmedian. So the first one, the predict survival function, I'm gonna call that on a sample of eight subjects from our test duration table. Um, eight, just because that was the number of curves that I thought might fit on the, the plot to the right, not for any methodological reason. Um, so we call that, I, I put it into a, uh, an output object called Y star, that's just a series. Um, it's a series for each of those eight subjects. And so then we plot that on the right and you can see that there is quite a big difference in um, the predicted survival curves for each of these subjects. So the blue curve at the top is uh, a subject that the model believes is not likely to have their first transaction for a long time, potentially not ever. Um, even after 130 days, the model predicts that there's only a 20% chance of them having a first transaction, 80% chance of survival versus that orange curve at the very bottom um, where the model is predicting a first transaction likely to happen within the first day. In fact, it's it's basically a zero probability that the, that that visitor will reach 20 days without a transaction. So we haven't yet even talked about whether this is a good model or not, but we can see the model is definitely learning something to distinguish these different visitors. So then let's come back to that code. The second line there, is the Cox proportional hazard model uh, predict median. So now we're gonna predict the median survival for each of those same, uh, well, for, for all of the subjects in the, the uh, test durations table. And then I just copied the, the predictions for those eight, the same eight randomly sampled subjects into the table below. Um, and so you can see in that table, the median prediction, this is the Y star median column on the right. And then you can see what, what the, uh, the actual outcomes were for those subjects. So the has transaction indicates whether they have had a transaction at all. And then the duration is the time that's elapsed since that user entered the system and either had their first transaction or was censored. And so this looks relatively good. I mean, so uh, subject, the top row here, subject 513374, um, the model predicts that the median uh, survival is is one day. So let's talk about what that means. If we go back to the curve, um, that's basically the point where that subject survival curve crosses the 50% mark, which isn't shown explicitly on that curve, but halfway between 0.4 and 0.6 survival probability would be 0.5. And so the model is saying how many days will have elapsed until that curve crosses the 0.5 mark. And for this subject, 513374, that is the orange curve at the very bottom. The model thinks one day will have elapsed um, when that user hits 50% probability. And that's why the orange curve is so low. And in fact, that is what happened in the actual data. That user had a transaction on the first day. So that, that model is looking pretty good. Um, the light blue, that's light blue, the second curve from the bottom is user 388461. The model predicts that user uh, user's median survival or 50% survival would be at three days. And in fact, that user did have a transaction on the first day. So we're off a little bit on the duration, but we directionally very, very good. <clears throat> in terms of the interpretation now, let's look at the last two rows in the table. So this is user 52716 uh, and visitor 1307495. So those two have predictions, median uh, survival predictions of infinity. So why would that be? That's because at the maximum number of days that this model has seen, which is about 130 here, their curves still have not passed 0.5. So this is that 
blue, the dark blue curve and the purple curve at the top of the plot to the right. So th that's users 52716. Um, this is the one where the model thinks they're, you know, even at 130 days, survival probability is 80%, which means transaction probability is 20%. So the model hasn't seen that curve, isn't predicting that curve to cross uh, 50%. And so as far as it knows, it's never going to cross 50%. And so the prediction is infinity. So again, in terms of the model, I don't want to over-index on this model because again, I made the data up. So it's not too much that I'm proving here, but directionally, the model seems to be doing pretty well and that it is for the, for the uh, visitors who never had a transaction, which is 52716 and 1307495, at the bottom of the table, the model is uh, correctly predicting that they will have the highest survival pr probability or lowest transaction probability. So that's, that's a pretty good sign. The model is doing decently, even though this is a very simple linear model with made up data. So positive signs, but I encourage you to explore further on your own. So that's mostly it. Let's, let's recap a few of the points. Uh, the key takeaways, um, as I said in the very beginning, the most important thing I would hope is, is the sales pitch. Next time you face a problem about time, durations, time to event, just stop to think for a second if survival analysis might be a good fit. Um, and in particular, it doesn't have to be about medicine. The event may be good um, and the event may never happen. So don't think that those three things would rule out using survival analysis. In particular, what a lot of people do is that option two that we saw on the event log, which is to threshold durations and turn it into a binary classification problem. So I want to reiterate that that can be an okay solution but only if your decision cadence <clears throat> is longer than the bulk of the survival distribution. Survival curves are powerful. Uh, we touched on some of the interpretation of, of how to read a survival curve, but I mean, I think one of the things I hope to show is that there's a lot of information in visualizing survival curves and visualizing differences of survival curves uh, between two samples, between cohorts, um, seeing how these survival curves change over time. There's a lot of information there and they can tell a very powerful story. Again, if you're a scooter executive and you see survival curves, either one survival curve or survival curve changing over time, it tells a very powerful story um, to your investors, to your board. And finally, check out Lifelines. Lifelines is an excellent package. Uh, it really has a lot of useful information just to learn about the field, not only to make it happen in, in Python code. Lastly, I put some, some links in the slides here if you want to access, access those later. If this talk has been interesting to you and, and piqued your interest, you know, of course, I have to plug my own writing uh, at crosstab.io. I've written a fair bit about survival analysis recently, but uh, also other data science topics. Um, Lifelines, Scikit Survival is another survival analysis package in Python. That's a different angle on prediction, especially. It takes a more machine learning focused uh, angle. Uh, using things like random forests, gradient boosted trees. Similarly, there was an excellent blog post from 2016 uh, about a method called WTTE, that's time to event, RNN, which is a neural network approach to churn prediction, uh, especially um, with a time to event or survival mindset. There's a couple other talks that I think are very good. One just a month ago by Alan Downey uh, at PyData about survival analysis in Python. And then for folks who are in the R world instead of Python, there's a very good intro blog by Emily Zabor, Emily Zabor called Survival Analysis in R. So I would strongly encourage you to check those out. That's it. Thank you very much.